Good afternoon. So welcome everyone to another Scalpful webinar of the Las Vegas series on modularity. If it's a pathway to cutting complexity in cost and architecture, we would normally be hosting this from our Melbourne Design Studio, and we're very much glad that the restrictions are easy in Melbourne. So we're hoping to welcome you there soon. Um, but this is our digital series, so we're very much happy to be able to welcome guests from interstate and internationally. Um, Please let us know where you're from, just in a chat option. If you can drop it in, we'll love to know where you're joining us from. Um, just give you a little bit of an overview of what we're going to cover today. So first of all, we just wanted to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, I will shortly pass you over to our managing director, Jeremy Napier, who will give you a background on our modular system. Um, as you might know, Scalfor is known for delivering custom solutions with our modular system. So that will give you a little bit of background while we're actually holding this talk on modularity. Um, we'll then go over to Jamie um, over on sunny Gold Coast from Hutchinson Modular, um, Eduardo from Sydney and Dr Tim O'Leary from University of Melbourne. So we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. So if we're going to ask you all, please drop your questions into the question tab. Once our speakers finish presenting, they will be answering those live if they can. Um, otherwise, we'll have the discussion at the end and we'll also send our follow-up email um, answering all your questions. So we do love to know. Um, your feedback as well. At the end of the presentation, we'll draw out um, our lucky winner prize, uh, Mo Angela and Don Pack. Um, that will draw out from people asking questions, so make sure you stay uh, till the end so you can let us know where to send your package to. Um, and that is all from me, and I will pass you over to Jeremy. Hello, everybody. Oops, no. Jeremy, you're on mute there. Sorry, I'll get this right. Um, hello, everybody. Sorry about that. Um, really glad to be part of this today. Modularity is a part of everything we do at Skull Form. It's part of our heart and soul and part of our origins. Um, and we're excited in all things connections and clips and Lego blocks, as you can see here. Um, so the connection between the aesthetic element on the right and the substrate interface on the left is the clip. And our, our clips are really our, our modules, if you like, or that connection between the baton and the clip and the track. Um, so where we really add value to our timber and aluminium connections is the effects that you can get through modularity um, achieved through our clips. Um, so as you can see, as we go through, the, um, the use of clip technology um, reduces the use of traditional fasteners. Um, it means well, part of our DNA is our love for concealed fixing. So concealed fixing obviously looks beautiful, but it actually is more serviceable as well. Um, we provide greater um, qu control over quality from both, I guess, the end result perspective, but especially for architects and being able to design th something and know that that is what's going to be built. Um, we obviously increase, oh, sorry, increase the efficiency so that you get a much faster install time. Um, and this all results as a in a lower overall cost um, with faster install time and better quality, less rework. Um, so part of, as we said, we started the company in 2005 and we really started pushing concealed fixing from the word go. So we were one of the first to have an external cladding system installed hardwood with concealed fixing. Um, we developed a concealed decking clip as well. So our, we really started in high-end residential architecture and focusing on the exteriors. But in about 2008, we developed the spring steel clip, which is from rather humble beginnings. So we just had the clip, and then we added that a track to that 
And then we really went on a journey with designers following where they took this element, and um, which landed up in 2013. That designers started using this concept on ceilings, and therefore we developed different track interfaces to for different applications, as you can see there. 2018, we really reinvented the product. Um, and we internally call our latest clip the dovetail clip, really inspired by the dovetail joining technique. And it's a um, it's a die cast aluminium body with a spring steel um, stainless steel wire inserted, and it has got complete invisibility and very high hold strength. So um, with that platform, it takes many forms. Um, just this year, we launched our click on cladding product, which is sort of light years away from our first one in 2005. Um, so it's an aluminium extruded product, but on the same reliable platform, um, it can be used for commercial exteriors. And we'll go through some of our projects. Um, this is our studio, which we did with Woods Baggett. You can see it's still the same platform but they challenged us and we started using a steam vent hockey stick. On the one on the right, we did that with Breathe Architecture and DKO. I um, mean, Arcadia in Sydney, once again, the same platform, but we introduced a curved button to which could take a curve. And various projects um, have different elements, but on the same platform. Um, and finally, we end up with a the veil, which is part of the M5 project um, in Sydney, which it really creates a sculpture over the tunnel entrance. So this shows the, the versatility of a basic, robust Lego block. So we look forward to what the rest of the presenters have for us. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. It's always good to be reminded of the journey we've been on. Um, now we go to our first speaker now, who's coming to us from Hutchinson Builders. And you might know Hutchinson Builders is one of Australia's largest privately owned construction companies with a turnover of over 2.8 billion um, last year nationally. And they've delivered over the last decade over $800 million worth of modular products. So Jamie's role as a BDM is very much hands-on and he is involved um, in all of the process from the initial budget estimates uh, to value and design management right through to contract negotiation. So um, looking forward to what Jamie has to present. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'll just get my slides up. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Kate, and, and, and thanks for having me on, and, and hello to everybody and our, our speakers and Jeremy, thanks for having us. So, uh, Hutchison Builders is, 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 is one of Australia's largest construction companies, and, and we do do a lot of modular, and, and my talk today, while not being uh, as, as smarter and, and, and technically brilliant as my other speakers, is, is more of a high level in, in terms of how we see the market and, and how we work within the market. Uh, and, and what we see. You can see from the, the slide on the screen gives a basic overview of our, our, our company. Uh, we do about 300 jobs annually. Um, there's lots of money in the bank, the offices over the country, uh, and it's successful because we're very diverse. We do from deck in someone's backyard to a $370 million skyscraper and everything in between, and that includes our modular business. So. I've just got a slide in there to, to show our, our coverage around the country. We also have a facility in Perth, a modular facility that's not being used at the moment. So we, we have a very broad reach and because of that reach, we we uh, we can cover most sectors and, and be involved in all of them. So the, the previous slide I, I, I breezed over, which was our traditional construction. So our traditional construction turns over about $2.8 million a year across 300 projects. Now, our modular one, by comparison, for the last nine years, we've done probably $750 million of product. Uh, we've done quite a lot of product, and, and, and that would make us one of the bigger producers in the country. And we specialise in the volumetric uh, methodology where we can build it, get it to about 95% complete, and, and then take it around. Now, in the last few years, as 
the modular industry is changing. We work with a lot of developers who are looking at things like panelised construction, bathroom pods now, which we've started doing. So there's a whole host of things, right down to little bits that can be bought in the sample. Uh, Jeremy's, Jeremy's demonstration of the Sculptform product is a fantastic one, all sorts of facade systems. So uh, as, as the industry grows, we're continuing to look at innovative ways where we can keep costs down and deliver a faster project, basically. And from the cost point of view, the main thing from a cost point of view is, is the labour cost. So if we can take things offside and build them in a controlled environment, we can normally do them more efficiently. There's less waste, there's less time on site, uh, which ultimately saves some money on the project. So that's sort of a, a basis of our of our modular operation. Our modular operation started by chance in 2011 during the GFC. Uh, there wasn't a lot of work around and it was started to mainly service the mining industry. And from there, we specialise now in a lot of modular hospitals, uh, schools we do a lot of, which will be my, the, the basis of my example today. Uh, but anything and everywhere is, is how our modular motto works. So this, this slide now is the, the, the one that I'll, I'll base most of my items on today. And, and this is a project that we're building now in Queensland. This is a state school building. Uh, it's a three-storey building. It's the first education building built in Queensland that's three storeys. And it, it's probably very similar to the stuff that schools infrastructure in New South Wales are starting to do. And there's been a couple built in Victoria as well. So, the and, and this is a very unique project as well because you can see from looking at it that it, it, it could look traditionally in, in situ construction instead of just being modular because of the precast elements. It has a lift, the, the screens, and it actually has face, face block work to the inside behind those screens. So, it really looks like it's an in situ product. Now, you can see the little blue squares on the bottom it has some high level facts on the building. And the biggest one there is the 32 weeks. So in terms of an advantage and disadvantage to modular, the biggest advantage of a modular product is, is time, basically, less time on site. And education is a great example of that because everyone in education cares about day one, term one, and having their kids in a brand new classroom. You know, if you're a month, a week later, it doesn't matter. You, you miss the day, you're in trouble. And it's also, education is another one, good, good one for modular because in terms of a cost comparison between modular and in situ, it, it needs to be considered a yield versus construction cost uh, and the yield of the project where the big thing with education is getting it on the date where if you're doing social housing or, or something like that, if you're delivering it late, you, you're still getting the same benefit. There, there's no emotion to having the kids in there. Or if you're doing something like a medical building, we do a lot of medical buildings because if we can deliver the same medical building three months early, they're treating patients in there and there's an enormous benefit. So that's one of the big advantages, disadvantages with modular, the, the, the two items of, of time, uh, you know, the, the benefit in it being modular and saving time. This project here, we built something a little bit smaller in Sydney last year, which was slightly more complex, but that program was 72 weeks. So you can see that there's an enormous saving in there, but the saving comes about because it's a very standardised design, which can be mass produced and we can, and, and that's how it saves time, where we can take something offside and, and bring it in there. On my next slide, I'm breaking it out, the building, where you can have different components of the modules, which helps with getting more efficiency and breaking down the barriers in terms of in situ and modular. And, making the project more of a hybrid where you can use different elements and you could do more of a traditional but you can break out elements like the screens, the precast, uh, the, the cladding systems and some of the internal elements um, which can create a better product because that's probably as far as the industry goes at the moment that's probably one of the bigger things holding it back that we see is that there's a misconception around something that's modular can only look like a donger or, or something from a mining camp. So it's harder for us as a business and I think for the industry in general to get those buildings into more mainstream and metropolitan areas where you have more readily available labour. And in that situation where you do have the readily available labour, sometimes the modular stuff 
isn't as competitive as in situ, where once you go to a regional location, it becomes much more beneficial because you don't have the labour pool. So there's lots of moving parts into a comparison where modular works better than in situ. But then where you do go in situ, now where the market's changing, where things like the sculpt form products, glazing packages and different elements can be used so you can achieve a hybrid and use different elements to save time and save money. So where Hutchie see the market going is the market is continually moving, but it needs more industry support and, and people to consider it and look through the options and alternatives to compare the cost for it to change and, and become more commonly accepted throughout the industry. Aside from the location being one of the main cost considerations, the, the other things to consider is that sometimes there's designs out there that are very hard to build in a modular format and it's easier to build in in situ. So a lot of the projects that we look at, and a very simple example is you could have a wall where there's a window right in between where you would need to do something. So there, there needs to be an element of collaboration between the design team and, and the module people to, to really get it to work and get to the best system. Um, so that's an area where, again, the, the industry could go and, and, and work together to tie things in more. Um, sorry, Kate, I'm not keeping track of time, so I'll just keep going until you tell me. Um, one, of, one of the big advantages of the modular is also if you do it early enough, while you save time, you can add things to it and, and be able to design things well so that you can get a better product. And that's probably where I see the industry now where there's a lot of great things. There's 3D printing, there's different materials that we can make. Uh, you know, some of the porcelain prints that you can use instead of tile. There's all these amazing things that if picked up early enough can be incorporated into a modular design. Um, but where I see it at the moment is just getting enough industry engagement so that products are used and things are used so it becomes more common, which will help drive the cost down. Um, and as we do that, that, that's where I see that the industry can change and move forward. That's great, Jamie. I think um, you've had some questions coming in there as well. I am... Um, Okay, uh, yeah, so the, the tallest building that we've built um, would be the, in, in a modular format. We did something that was three storeys, uh, it was quite a large format building that was in the Pilbara in, in, in north northwest WA. Uh, Hickory do it very successfully in Melbourne where they have their own system where they can, can build up, up to quite high. But from a fire rating point of view, once you get over three storeys, that fire rating design is you can, you can go right up from there. That's that's the cutoff between the fire rating. So the, the same design that we have for three stories, you could take all the way to twenty stories. Thanks for um, for answering that. Um, and I think we'll move on to our next um, presenter. There. That's me, right? Uh, it is yourself. Yeah, let me just get um, the slide open. So, um, Eduardo is our next presenter. Um, he's joining us from Sydney. He's Associate Lecturer at University of Sydney um, and he's a Director of Barada. Um, this is actually our second time approaching Eduardo to present. And if you joined us earlier in the year, a few months back, for our webinar for the makers behind the Australian Timber Design Awards, uh, you heard the presentation from one of his other projects, which was the Hexbox Canopy. Um, and just a little side note, uh, both of them are still in the running for the Australian Timber Design Awards. They haven't been announced, so we're still old friends, so we're good. Um, and I'll pass you over now to Eduardo. I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. A lot of his work focuses around the digital fabrication. All right, thank you so much, Kate. And yeah, thanks again for the, um, for the invite today. Um, I am going to sort of talk about two projects, or I'll try to talk a little bit about this project that has also been presented before, which sort of bookends a decade of, uh, of work looking into sort of forms of, of digital fabrication. Um, I also just wanted to throw in here as well, because we're on the sort of subject of, uh, 
of modularity was um, uh, Jean Prouvé, a French architect, industrial designer, designed the demountable house back in 1945. So, you know, we're looking at something which is almost you know, 80 years old here. And so the idea of modularity and prefabrication has also been around for an extremely long time. And it's, um, it's sort of interesting to see why it's taken such a long time to sort of um, appear as a sort of more uh, dominant thing within the markets. And I think that's probably because um, of the um, so many sites not necessarily being appropriate for implementing sort of a sort of a modular factory made uh, product. Um, I wanted to also put this slide in, which is sort of the development of that, which is Greg Lynn's um, Embryological House from, from 2000. And sort of leading up uh, to this, and after, uh, uh, I guess after probably 20 years now of sort of investigations into digital fabrication and digital design, uh, these are the sort of things that uh, have been developed whereby we're no long, longer looking at something which is sort of a mass mass produced uh, product, but we can actually look at uh, mass customization. So not you could mass produce in the same way, or you could mass produce the same thing a thousand times, or you could mass produce something which is a thousand different things. And I think that's sort of um, what I want to touch on with, with some of the projects that we're, we're, um, I'm going to talk through. So the first project um, is um, a roof canopy that uh, we designed uh, back in uh, 2010. Um, this was when I was working for a company um, called Urban Future Organization. Um, it's a, it's the, at the back of a, uh, uh, a multi-residential building um, in, uh, in the uh, Sydney CBD, just where the sort of A is located. And um, it's the, the terrace was sort of way, way at the sort of back of the building here. Um, the issue that we had was, or the sort of the brief from the client, was that they had this outdoor terrace which uh, received sort of the brunt of um, uh, neighbors' debris falling from, 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 the, from their sort of terraces above. Uh, they couldn't really use the space for their, for their, their three daughters, so they wanted some type of enclosure. Um, we wanted to build something sort of fairly cost effective that could sort of uh, deal with the, the sort of rubbish in a sort of safe way um, and so still create sort of a great space for, to, to sort of for them to be able to, to use it. Um, the issues that we had um, was that we had very restricted site access. We had sort of a lift, which was only two meters uh, cubed. Um, we had also a non orthogonal shaped um, uh, um, sort of boundary to the site. So there were sort of a number of issues that we, we sort of um, had to address in terms of its uh, constructability. And the idea of something which was sort of uh, prefabricated, um, that could be made in small components and easily carried up onto site was sort of the strategy uh, that we went through. So um, at the time, my colleague is sort of a bit of a whiz at scripting. So we uh, designed, um, this uh, um, sort of self-regulating um, surface that would make sure that we um, accommodated the boundaries of the site and then also these uh, two skylights which um, made sure the light fell down to the, um, to the swimming pool below. So we built this um, uh, uh, sort of network of cables which uh, self-regulated themselves and made sure that we always had a uh, fall uh, to these to these skylights. So anything that did fall on it, including sort of rain and any other debris, would always fall towards um, these skylights. Um, so as a result of sort of generating these uh, these sort of surfaces, you're you're sort of left with um, like a, either a mesh or sort of um, a, a contour map which you need to then rationalize and, and, and generate some type of uh, component from. And um, if you take obviously a flat component, uh, like a square component, you can obviously bend it in one way. But as soon as you start bending it in the other direction, you sort of start tearing it and um, you actually, um, doesn't, it sort of doesn't really work um, unless you sort of have overlap. So the sort of uh, easiest strategy is actually just to um, uh, triangulate uh, the system. So we, um, we used a, a program which is pretty prevalent these days uh, called Grasshopper, which is a parametric plugin for um, 
for a uh, 3D modeling software called Rhino. And we built um, everything within there. So everything had a relationship to each other. So if you move one element, everything else updates. Um, and the nice thing about doing something like this is that you have these models which aren't necessarily specific for that one site. You could then take another site which has a different boundary condition. It might have four skylights or a thousand skylights, and it would then still operate in the same way. It would just have obviously many more parts. So we sort of um, went through this process of, of sort of designing this, um, understanding the falls and sort of how to, how to sort of uh, start making it. Obviously, having a structural engineer involved to uh, give us an understanding of sort of where we needed to um, make things a little bit thicker or provide additional bracing. Um, the, then we had to sort of understand then what was going to be the fabrication process. So something which was fairly cost effective and fairly simple. Um, we chose um, uh, just a sort of CNC fabrication. So everything was cut out on a flat sheet. Uh, which you can sort of see on the um, on the left hand side here. Everything was cut out on a flat sheet, and then all the edges folded in order to provide structural stability. Um, with this, though, everything had to be labelled, so all the edges had to be had given a um, a degree, so the fabricated node knew how to bend each edge, and everything had to be labelled so we knew which triangle sat next to which triangle. We also had some additional. Um, steel elements that connected in between and um, to sort of form additional uh, rigidity. And so then generating these types of drawings uh, to provide a sort of roadmap for us to start placing, putting this together. Um, this, is, uh, this is the picture of the poor uh, fabricator folding all of our 300 parts. And he actually only got two edges incorrect, which was pretty, pretty amazing. Um, uh, Hanging them all as they're being as they're being sort of uh, uh, painted, and then the process of beginning to assemble on site. So this was this was sort of a half um, private uh, uh, client, but also engaging with the university and our students as a sort of a construction design elective in order to understand how to build these things. And again, what's interesting about this is the 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 drawings that we had to provide to council for them to understand what we were doing weren't going to be the drawings that we'd use to actually make this thing. We actually just needed a very simple plan map uh, with numbers and locations in order to, to assemble this. So up on the top left-hand corner, you can see these uh, big uh, sort of gutter ring beams, which sat around uh, these skylights, and then everything started growing incrementally um, from, uh, from the, those parts. So this was sort of the end result of, um, of, uh, of the... Uh, of the, the roof structure. Um, the canopy or sort of the, the, the glazing, clear glazing on the top is actually just polycarbonate, which we also just cut in the CNC machine. And then all the uh, uh, interface between each one was just uh, silicon sealed. So um, the idea that it was, again, be able, being going to be able to form some sort of protection for the users, still maintaining as much light as possible and also being able to sort of filter any debris that uh, sort of uh, fell down in between in the space. Um, and um, this was sort of the, the end result in the end. So this uh, sort of very customized, um, um, uh, I guess, um, yeah, uh, structure, but was also made out of uh, these sort of prefabricated uh, modular elements. Each one's slightly different, but again, the sort of programming behind it meant that um, they all had the sort of same relationships between each one. We didn't really have to design each individual one. It was just about sort of designing the relationships. Now, I actually only have 30 seconds to go, so I think I probably don't need to really go into the sort of the, the other project at all. Um, just wanted to say that, I mean, now within the University of Sydney and sort of most uh, universities now, we have access to these um, these these type of facilities. So we have CNC machines, we have um, industrial robots, uh, all of these amazing tools that allow us to sort of test uh, the field of what sort of what can be can be possible. Oh, and there's my alarm. Okay, thank you so much for listening. Thanks, Eduardo. That's um, it's a lot of ground covered there. And just a reminder to everyone, we will send out an email with the contacts. So. Um, 
don't feel like you're missing out. I know it's a very short time to present. Um, and then we'll go on to our final speaker, Dr. Tim Leary. I'll just pull up that slide. He's a um, full-time lecturer at University of Melbourne, teaching um, cost management. So his research and teaching industry collaboration cover the fields of construction, economics and management, property development, residential energy efficiency, housing markets, low carbon, smart sustainable buildings, information technology and BIM. That's quite a mouthful there. Uh, Tim holds Masters of Architecture degree from University of South Australia and as well as a PhD in the area of sustainable energy engineering of buildings. Um, and he has particular interest in achieving greater lifetime affordability for housing in Australia. I'll pass it over to Tim. Thanks. Thanks, Kate. I and um, I'm just bringing in my slides, and it's a. I'm delighted to be uh, invited by Kate and the team at School Form to uh, to be part of this seminar. And um, yeah, I, I have this academic background across research, and um, I um, I'm not really going to be talking about um, the uh, you know in depth in any any way i suppose uh, uh, case studies uh and um you know my own research has lead more towards um energy performance and environmental performance in buildings but i do teach cost management and i'm a quantity surveyor and my background is in uh, analyzing building costs so i've got something to say on uh the cost and and maybe um ties in what what jamie said from a his perspective as been someone out there at the coalface and and uh, also things about uh, things maybe tying in with with Eduardo from the uh, the research and and what I'm really presenting is um, not what I'm doing myself uh, daily but there's a lot going on in the space of modular and prefab in research and I'll uh, be talking about that so um, so there are, there are I mean obviously the examples of practice out there in uh, in Australia uh, things like CLT have been around things um, like pods um, hickory's um, work in Melbourne has been mentioned um, and um, uh, I think uh, this uh, getting back to, to the slides there are this is from a, a document which I'm going to um, discuss very briefly which um, came out uh, an, an innovation hub for um, manufacture of uh, modular and prefab. Um, and so uh, we, we mentioned, uh, I think it was a Jamie, that it was uh, in the area of schools and some of the um, uh, issues around delivering schools. And in Victoria, there is a, a, a schools building program which um, focuses on, um, on modular. So there's uh, something in, in terms of Victoria in, in terms of schools. Now with the research that's going on in Melbourne, this is um, under a, a Centre for Advanced Manufacturing and Prefabricated Housing. You'll see there a reference to the ARC, Australian Research Council, that's where um, uh, university researchers go to get funding for different projects and this is um, uh, being funded. It talks about um, over four years, about $6 million of funding, so there's quite a bit going on. And in the center, um, there are a number of um, so projects, a number of themes of research. And I think we'll be sharing the link to this um, as part of the presentation so you can um, delve more deeply into um, things around um, advanced building systems and assembly, um, innovation in design, uh, looking at new materials uh, and hybrid systems. Uh, and also um, more broadly supply chains and, and financing. So um, there was a, um, uh, a symposium uh, around this time last year, which brought together a lot of the uh, researchers and, and uh, PhD students and academics in this field. So um, everything from looking in you know, individual topics like acoustic performance to um, life cycle assessment uh, and so forth. So I myself am not a chief investigator on any of these um, projects, but um, in our link um, you'll be able to get you know closer to what's going on. 
Uh, one of the sectors that is, is interesting is um, the healthcare sector, and I think Jamie has talked about um, uh, Hutchinson's building, um, medical facilities and hospitals. The, um, the impetus here um, is a cost driver. Um, they've, you know, um, governments, you know, have found hospitals are very expensive buildings to build and, 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 they, and they are by their nature with all the stuff that has to go into them. But there's a big driver for um, bringing down the cost. And so um, this is an example uh, through OSCO of their approach. And um, uh, they, they've been doing some, some work in that, in that area. So this innovation hub is an exciting um, development in, um, in prefab in Australia. Um, a pitch was made by uh, nearly over about 100 organizations. And I, I think Hutchinson's are a part of this as one of the organizations, and that was to get some funding from the federal government. Uh, and it's now up and running. They uh, secured about $2 million for this, um, uh, you know, hub. Now there's um, stuff goes on there, like um, at the technical level, like they're, they're looking at um, uh, how to bend steel uh, in, uh, in off-site ways. And, uh, and they're also, as well, I think one of the things that Jamie mentioned was the perception of uh, prefab or modular being, um, you know, mining camps and low quality or, you know, demountable and bring that perception up to more high quality and maybe with Eduardo architecturally led and, and so forth. So um, uh, Australia is seen as um, possibly, you know, not... Um, as far down the track in terms of uh, modular uh, compared to other places. So if you think about Sweden and certainly in, in the residential area, a country like Sweden is very geared towards, um, you know, 80, 80, 90 percent modular type building. So I don't want to turn the last bit of my presentation into an undergraduate lecture, um, but just I have thought I'd outline, you know, all of the factors that, you know, Jamie's talked about and Eduardo, from the design uh, and the issues that have to uh, be looked at to the production and also, you know, transport, storage and um, assembly. And then there are some other uh, things that are factored in, which even go to the level of um, the uh, incentives that there might be uh, uh, drivers to go to modular and, and things to do with the building code. And we know then as, you know, as we build higher, the building code becomes uh, uh, a greater factor to 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 look at when when some researchers looked at the comparison of modular to on-site they sort of look at it in the um, areas of uh, time and cost obviously but often environmental performance is something that's being looked at and what uh, the, the the emissions mix is what the carbon footprint is um, and there's some work that um, been done by a few researchers in University of New South Wales on uh, on that. So we've said that um, if we look at sort of the advantages, clearly reduced time um, in in uh, as as Jamie was was saying, getting that um, building uh, on time, if not uh, in a quicker uh, build. And um, uh, there's some uh, links here to some research about as many as you know as much as saving half the time in the building, and um, you know it reduces things like um, the disruption that you have in sight and you, you don't have to deal with the weather as much as you you might have to um, and and so forth but there's also I think Eduardo um, touched on this in some cases um, there is a flip side you, you can have sites that are just too difficult and modular uh, might be constrained in in those particular instances so there is a sort of a flip side to that but the key cost drivers like uh, any sort of quantity surveyor can model uh, the cost of a modular building in the same sort of techniques that they do for a traditional build and all of these um, costs. Um, but I guess with, um, with modular, one of, the, one of the, so the, the number one element that say quantity surveyors, cost planners have the most difficulty grappling with is the, the preliminaries elements. And this is the, the, you know, the offsite, the overheads, the insurances and that, and with modular, that that's an element that's going to be um, uh, having a greater influence. So um, 
we know the cost advantages could be looked at in areas such as the uh, the labor i think jamie mentioned the the labor component was a big driver um, you've got more predictability in in some of your costings when you're uh, you know looking at modular of course specification level is always a big driver of cost with quality control as an element of less rework and uh, reduced material waste and waste handling with the with the the, off, the penalty for offsite of course you do have to have um, manufacturing facilities and and overheads and there's an element of I guess front loading the the costs of the projects with with prefab and modular, and you have your transportation and storage, so not necessarily cheaper. But if you save on time, you clearly you know a developer. That's that's what a developer is looking at the overall feasibility and time saved would be um, you know not just getting maybe for the school getting the kids in early. Time saved for a developer of a retail facility or a, an office would be getting tenants in earlier and would be getting um, uh, you know greater rent. So when you look at the life cycle costs from a, I suppose from a research point of view, um, some studies from the UK of of referenced uh, KPMG did a, in the UK did a had a look at these and um, uh, it was sort of an, a more anecdotal evidence that that offsite manufacturing can generate some uh, some whole life cost savings and um, I mean there is a, uh, a paucity of, of real information on this if you go to price books and as a quantity surveyor look for information you you, you tend not to find a lot in the um, specifics of uh, uh, differentials and modular um, components but um, it does it does point to there being a benefit in um, uh, reducing the whole life costs and that's a, a plus for uh, modular and prefab and with that I think I'll uh, wrap up my, my presentation and, and join the question and, and answer so thank you for for having me thank you Timothy that was a really good presentation so I know we had some questions coming in and some of the speakers have been answering them um, I'd actually like to put um, an overall question to everyone since kind of in an open forum. In terms of modularity and modular construction, where do you see the development, where's the biggest area of growth? Um, and um, we we'll probably can take it from the top so nobody's fighting for who's speaking next. Um, well, I mean, I guess from my perspective, it's always uh, with sort of in the realm of, realm of um, uh, the sort of academic side. Uh, so, in terms of how these this work works on sites, and in terms of costs, I'm sort of not so sure about. But I I I, I think I still think that um, uh, the sort of benefits now of uh, more accessibility to technology is allowing us to sort of understand um, these processes sort of a lot easier. So, sort of some of the things that sort of Jamie was discussing in terms of like these modular elements. If you can design these as sort of a set of relationships where you can actually design the module but you can sort of adjust the relationships to have many different parts quite easily so you know you design the relationships of one classroom for example but changing some parameters allows you to then generate 10 different classrooms quite easily and then you can unfold all that information and and, uh, and quickly lay it out for to be built i see sort of that process of being uh, really interesting folding into something which is in, instead of just making the one thing many many times I sort of see that as uh, really sort of adv advantageous It's almost like a hybrid isn't it and um, crossing the bridge between custom um, construction so that um, you're not losing that architectural edge as well. Yeah, absolutely Uh, from my end, I, I see in, in terms of sectors and ed education being a big one, but uh, generally across the industry, I, I think that uh, with the innovation in design, it allows for better integration of the kit of parts as well as, a, as, well as the larger volumetric stuff, making it more affordable. I, I see that helping it uh, become more mainstream. So if I, if I, if I look at the, you know, the triple constraints of building in time cost and quality I think the other things things like sectors like um, schools and healthcare would be safety and and sustainability comes in and I think modular 
can uh, can be shown and demonstrated to um, you know give better outcomes um, and you can uh, you know you can test things uh, before they're built and you can be more assured of some quality in relation to those things so there there is these advantages I think that the industry um, is bringing with with modular um, that that would be my take on that um, so where we see it from our perspective as a um, as a building material manufacturer is the the gap between um, design software and 3D modeling software like you know Rhino and Grasshopper and the um, and building technology is is pretty big you know it's like at least 20 years apart um, and one of the things about modular is in effect what those parameters or constraints that Eduardo was putting into Grasshopper there are actually elements of a Lego block, if you like. I mean, really what you created there, Eduardo, was a type of Lego block you put into Grasshopper. And um, where we see, our, where we're trying to push our development as a company is being able to um, develop that interface between the design software and the data that it produces and the factory floor to produce each component. So you mentioned even the labeling, like something as simple as where does each piece go is actually a big deal. Um, and so the handling and labeling of each component, all the logistics around that um, enables us. So we are actually quoting on some, some large public jobs at the moment um, where there's a completely 3D type ceiling um, and it's not just a series of um, a series of the same shape, like it just evolves across the whole ceiling or across thousands of square meters. Well, doing that off site is absolutely critical because the risk, we haven't really discussed much the risk on a commercial building site of things blowing out is just enormous. It's just a complete nightmare. So I don't know if that makes sense. It's pretty exciting, the whole bridging that gap between the drawing and the and the finished project. Thanks, Jamie. And I just um, want to cross that into um, it's kind of similar, but I think Tim mentioned before that modular construction, something like 80, 90 percent was it in Sweden? Well, certainly in the residential field, yeah. It's, it's which, at the level. Which is huge. So obviously we have, um, there's a lot of opportunity there and we've covered a lot of the advantages of it. What's the biggest um, opportunity for us here in Australia, um, the area of improvement, so to make it modular construction more, um, not sure that we want it to be 80, 90 percent, but. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we talk, they talk about industry transformation and the, you know, changing the perception of um, modular and, and then people in the field, people like Hutchinson actually doing it and delivering and delivering levels of quality uh, and delivering things quicker, all of those things are going to um, maybe push that percentage up, uh, what the limit is, um, what the industry will transform and look like in you know, 20, 30 years time is a great sort of research question, a crystal ball thing, but clearly uh, I suppose the comment was, and to, to relate it to overseas, was that Australia, um, despite having, you know, um, uh, remote, you know, need for remote um, uh, working, you know, like the mining thing. Um, we have relatively low levels of of modular and 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 prefab compared to some other countries. So, was I, um, it, so oh. Jamie said the impetus for their for their company came out of. Um, the mining, I think. Can I quote you on that, Jamie? Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's correct. And, and that's where um, the, the biggest thing that needs to be considered in, in this answer is geography as well. Australia's an island a long way from anywhere. And, and, and Tim talked earlier about the stuff happening in Europe. And I, I think uh, in Singapore, someone probably knows more than me, but I, I thought it was a much higher percentage moving forward had to be modular because of not, not enough growth and time where our stuff is more structured to the remote nature. So I, I think as our modular, modular industry has been born out of the, the, a direct result of, of remoteness other than a need to do things quickly. And, and now we're just picking that up. 
I was going to say, like off the back of sort of Timothy's comment about uh, Sweden, you know, they have a very small window of time where you actually want to be outside building. Um, and obviously their industry is sort of geared around that, like building things which can be predominantly made in a factory and then actually being on site is sort of reduced and that's been totally influenced by their environment. Whereas obviously in Australia, building is, it's okay, it's obviously, a t it's a tough job, but it's, you're in a sort of a, an easier climate to sort of operate in. Yeah, and I guess Sweden, the land of Ikea, I, I don't know, I don't want to, you know, sort of say, but, you know, it kind of goes with, with that um, Swedish um, thing. So, but, you know, the um, outlook ahead when you consider the federal government funding things like the Prefab Innovation Hub and, and the centres, they're getting money from the government. Um, they wouldn't have got that um, six million over four years without industry players coming on board and the government thinking that this is an area of you know priority in terms of transforming design and construction thanks for that guys uh, this might be a bit of a, a how long is a piece of string question but if we're talking in terms of time saving if you're comparing traditional construction and modular construction what what are we talking about how much do we get to save um well, in, in, in one, you know, in some studies up to half, up to 50%, but I can't tell you for sure what that, you know, all the stats that went, the data that that was based on, but, um, you know, it, it's it's substantial. Um, a lot of on-site stuff um, is just, you know, bad, bad from a time, um, you know, trades have to wait for another trade to finish something. There's all sorts of factors that slow up the construction process on, on a traditional site. We could talk about it all day, you know, all the different things that can and do go wrong that, that lead to um, delay. I mean, that's a good question for Jamie, who's uh, typically probably spending more time on site and seeing actually all the things that can and do go wrong. Uh, yeah, look, it, it, it's definitely much, much quicker. So the, the three-storey building that we talked about there, there's 15 classrooms and that, and the closest product our business has made was a two-storey one that was 500 metres uh, less in total area. Uh, and that was delivered in 72 weeks, where ours was 32. Uh, from, from a healthcare point of view, it's uh, we can deliver, most recent one, we delivered a thousand square metre building and, and, and that would take twice as long to, to build it in situ. We were 20 weeks modular and I think our in situ program was about 42. Um, so the, depending on the application, there's significant time savings. So an interesting point, isn't there, if we apply um, systems thinking to the whole concept, on a traditional building site, there's a huge level of dependency, um, like we're saying with, on other trades, and then you actually get like cascading dependencies that blow out, and we feel the brunt of it often because we're here at the end end of the process as well. Which that's what offsite building does, doesn't it, Jamie? I mean, like it's you've got control. Yeah, so de-risking de it. We, we take on a lot of construct, uh, and to be able to do that, it, the more we can control and de-risk it, the, the, the better the outcome. Um, I know that, Jamie, you're answering that question online. Um, I was curious, um, this is might be more for Tim, but feel free to jump in. Um, while we're talking about costs um, going overboard and flow-on effect, um, Tim, from your point of view, when we're starting looking at um, cost planning, uh, part of the project, and then when we get towards the end and when we're actually delivering, what are the biggest areas that actually cause projects to go over budget? Well, um, I guess um, it depends on the procurement methodology and you know what what's in the budget, and often cost overruns are not so much about the building, but about um, other bits that aren't so much the building. Um, you know, you have to take a very holistic view. Say with a hospital, um, you know, could be the record management system that goes in, which is a very specialist 
been is what blows the budget. But generally with buildings, obviously the the upfront, um, the time to influence uh, cost is is in the early stages. Um, and, um, and so uh, I think modular prefab would bring a discipline to um, the early stage design that in some cases in um, this world we live in of design and construct, it gets, some of the design gets kicked down the road into the construction phase or overlaps with construction and you're changing things while you're actually building. And that's a big um, the thing for variations and the variations are what cause cost blowouts, changes. Thank you for that. Um, we're getting close to the end of the hour and just want to ask if anyone had um, any comments before we wrap up. Um, if not, what I'll do now, I'll just draw out a winner of our lovely Maud and Shandon pack. And as I said, that comes out of the question section. Um, now, I hope I pronounced the name right there, Christian Trusen. Um, so if you're here, just yell out in the chat um, that you're still online and we'll grab your details from you. Um, and while that's coming in, we've got some contacts there as well. So obviously the main sculpt, uh, sculpt form uh, contact number and we'll be able to direct you to the right area. Um, if you're looking for Melbourne Design Studio, visit Blake Proud as our business development and studio manager um, that he can take, um, take you through what we've opened there. And if you're looking to collaborate with us on any future events or would like to suggest a topic for us to present to next time, uh, get in touch with myself. And we've got Christian online, which is great. It is your lucky day, Christian, yes. So um, I'll drop you an email or we'll grab your details to send out um, your pack. And in the meantime, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us and to all of our speakers and presenters. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you later, everyone.